Thank you for that very warm welcome. And let me start by saying congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, because we won, if this one works. No? Like this? Like green one? Yeah! <laughs> we won! All of us in this room, we are members of the most amazing, most bright, most powerful species on the planet. We are not challenged, we are not threatened, not by any other than ourselves. We, we won the great evolutionary race. But we are not here because we are survival of the fittest. We're here because we're survival of the nurtured. We are here because of one essential part of human nature, our ability for compassion. Let's face the facts, ladies and gentlemen. If survival of the fittest was the most valuable principle of evolution and the one that paved the way for intelligent brains, then it probably wouldn't have been us, but the uh, direct descendants of Tyrosaurus rex who had invented the steam engine and been able to split the atom. <laughs> there are far stronger, far bigger, and much more robust animals out there than us. You see, at birth, humans are, without comparison, the most incomplete, the most helpless of all animals. And our children are the ones with the greatest need for love and caring commitment. But actually, that became the key to our evolutionary success. It is care and commitment which became the key to our large human brain and therefore to our success. You see, in order for our offspring to survive, we had to develop this very large human brain containing exactly those neural networks needed to create desire and motivation to take care of other people. So we can override our own needs. We can understand other people's needs. We can show empathy. We can share with each other. We can learn from each other. Without care and attachments between humans, we would not have survived. And without the empathy, the responsibility, the cooperation derived from that care, without compassion, we would never have won the great evolutionary race. And we would never have developed art, culture, or global commercial companies. Because essentially, compassion is a very old survival strategy. A strategy that has led to the fact that we are still here, even though 99% of all species that ever lived on this planet are now extinct. We are still here. Compassion is a strategy which not only evolution, but also science have cooperated again and again. And what we say is that on all bottom lines, financial, social and human, we will see positive effects if we start taking modern society's rapid development and increasing problems seriously. Our point is that sustainable growth, sustainable use of human talent, intellect and resources calls for a creation of a more human context for existence and therefore for our ability for compassion. Because with compassion, we can create a healthy organization and good business without compromising everybody's well-being and balance. Compassion is much more than well-being. It's much more than love and care. It's a strategy that calls for wisdom, for strength, for courage. The scientific definition of compassion is this, a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others with a deep commitment to try to relieve and prevent it. And you see, the basis of the concept of compassion is the fact that being human is tough. We know this might sound a bit heavy or even sad, especially on a day like this, but every human experiences illness, loss, grief, rejection, injustice in life. We know it if we think about it. It's a part of our common humanity. It is a fact of life, of being human. So therefore, compassion is about suffering. 
Also, the suffering we are experiencing in an ordinary work life in modern society. Most of us, us would probably not refer to everyday problems as suffering, but we don't have to. Our human brain does it for us. Our brain makes no distinction between struggling to make a deadline or negative feedback from the boss on one hand and the major things in life which we are used to referring to as suffering on the other. Our brain reacts and causes us to suffer, and that's not our fault. So this is why compassion is such a very important factor if we are to live and not just to survive also when life is hard. Compassion is a motive that organizes our mind. It's not the only motive we have as humans, but when compassion is a motive, then it will affect our emotions, our reactions, our thinking, our reflection, and our actions. And this is why compassion is so central to the way we relate both to ourselves and to other people. So what can we say about compassion and happiness at work? When we let compassion be a guiding motive in our life, a race in happiness will follow. We say this with great confidence, not just because we truly believe it, because, but because we as Alexander have wonderful scientific data to support it. Because compassion is about recognizing suffering as part of our common humanity, compassion is tough. Compassion takes courage, it takes strength, and it takes wisdom. But with compassion, we can not only make our lives and our workplaces better, we can make the world better. And in the end, isn't that what happiness is all about? And you, ladies and gentlemen, you are or will be the leaders of today. So you have the power to bring this out into the world so we can make it a better place for all of us. I know this might seem a bit far-reaching, so let's turn to data and you will see that compassion is actually worth the effort. Because compassion is deeply founded or grounded in scientific data, and we have picked just a few for you today. It might not be entertaining, but we promise you that it will at least be thought-provoking. First of all, and central for this day today, compassion increases mindfulness and happiness, and it decreases worry. Compassion enhances psychological safety. This has influence on confidence to speak your mind and securely navigate changing organizational frameworks, the trust in and the respect for colleagues. And compassion increases employees' loyalty and commitment to the organization, and it reduces staff turnover. Even in relation to pure performance, compassion is relevant. It positively related to higher personal standards, it's associated with a greater degree of cognitive flexibility or creativity, and it provides more objective evaluations of your own competences and performances. And if we want committed employees who can develop themselves, each other, and the company, compassion is what we need. Because data also shows us that compassion triggers a greater desire to learn and develop. Compassion enhances our willingness to try again when we make mistakes. And it leads to enhanced self-reflection, optimism, and motivation. It is perhaps thought-provoking that a single concept, a single attribute, a single focus should have so great influence on people's well-being, happiness and balance. But actually, it's not that strange at all. It's all rooted in that old human brain, the one we inherited from our ancestors, the one which has developed over more than 120 million years. In mind work, we say that all change start with the feeling. There's a good reason for this, because what's really inside the brain's control center are the effect regulation systems. That is where the brain regulates our condition, how we're feeling, and as a result, our behavior, what we do. 
And all human behavior is fundamentally aimed at one of three things to secure our survival. First of all, it's about avoiding something. This, uh, to ensure this, the brain uses negative feelings such as fear, anger and disgust. We call this the threat system or the red system. And it's about achieving something. This is stimulated through joy and excitement. We call this the drive system or the blue system. And finally, it's about being attached to and connected to other people. This gives us a feeling of affiliation, contentment and peace of mind. We call this the soothing system or the green system. The red system is designed with the sole purpose of making sure that threats we encounter do not kill us and thereby making us evolutionarily redundant. It's the red system that generates a lot of energy and makes us ready to escape when danger is at hand. The red system is our better safe than sorry system. It's what makes us instinctive. It's our better too much than too little system. Or as evolutionary psychologists say, you can have lunch many times in life, but you can only be lunch once. <laughs> the blue system guides, motivates and urges animals and humans to want, pursue and consume. The system ensures that we are on the lookout for opportunities, that we perform and that we constantly move on. The things we can pursue can be sex, food, or power. It can be good grades, promotion, or for some of us, maybe a new Gucci bag. The system activates positive emotions such as joy and excitement to stimulate a behavior where we move fast, where we are determined, and where we keep our eye on the target. If the blue system is the start button, then the green system is the pause button. The green system is all about affiliation and connection between people, and it is essential for our survival. When the green system is activated, we can find <clears throat> peace for a while. We can be content with the state of things. And yeah, we know this might sound a bit strange in a modern society where performance of some sort or another is always a priority. There are no good or bad systems in the brain. We need them all at different times. The key word is balance. When the systems balance, we are okay and we feel well. And then we can be the best versions of ourselves. But if we take a close look at modern life, both our personal and professional lives, this old brain structure is challenged. The society of today overstimulates the threat and drive systems. That leads to poor well-being, lack of happiness, and underperformance. Just think about changes, new public management, efficiency improvement, handling of family and work, quality controls of ourselves and our children. This goes directly to the red system, signaling danger. We can get insecure, Watch out, be on your guard, or ask questions like, can I really cope with this? What will happen to me, my career, my family? And at the same time, we are constantly bombarded with op optimization requirements, with development goals, bonuses, comparisons, competition, not just at work, but also on social media and in our private lives. And all this goes straight to the blue system, urging us to constantly move on and perform. And meanwhile, meanwhile, you very often forget to stop, calm down, be present, be satisfied with how things are, with ourselves, each other, and our achievements. So the green system is understimulated. But for humankind, the green system is crucial for us because the tranquility it contains keep the old reptile brain structures in control. It reconnects the large new human brain. It allows us to be rational. It allows us to have access to our unique human 
intelligence. But in modern society, we get this imbalance to the left. Two of the systems are in manual overload. And then the oldest parts of the brain ceases power. Thinking, reflection, fellowship and tolerance are limited because these newer, higher brain functions are invalidated in a system which is only shouting for survival. The blue system goes me, 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 further, faster, higher, while the red system goes run, run, run and desperately tries to gain control over who, what, where. To put it in simple terms, we quite simply switch off the large, rational new brain, the one that makes us human. And we end up functioning only on the most primitive parts of the brain, the ones that makes us act like Komodo dragons instead of colleagues. Oh, but come on, let's not be naive. <laughs> it's a condition of modern working life and in modern organizations that the old brain gets challenged. It cannot be avoided. At least not from time to time. And the goal of modern man is not to stop improvements or innovations. It's not to earn less money, or for that matter, to just have a nicer time. The goal of modern humans must be to apply a more sustainable approach to high performance and result making. An approach based on the greatest resource we have, the human brain. The key here is balance. What every human brain is looking for, what is needed for every human brain to thrive and perform at its best. And therefore, the way to achieve well-being and happiness is by focusing on balance in the effect regulation systems. So if we in our organizations in our communication, in our employee development, and most importantly, in our leadership training, make room for that which activates the green system. If we make room for both ourselves and our, one another, and especially for both our reactions and our relationships, then we can restore the balance. And then the human brain will thrive, then we will thrive, we switch on our large human brain, and we become real, compassionate people. And all this might sound a bit far-reaching, so we'll finish on, on a simple note in regards to tips and specific tools. You can start on those occurring in an ordinary working life. Basically, it's all about incorporating the effect regulation systems, both our own and those of our colleagues, into everything we do together and apart. So we can think about how about the words I'm using in my email? Do they communicate to the red or the blue system of the receiver? And is that what I actually want? And what about the pace at which I move from one meeting to another? Does it help me switch on or switch off my human brain? What about when I enter a room, how does my entrance affect the red system or the green system of the other people attending that meeting? How about my eye contact, my tone of voice, my body language? And I need to consider what system the person sitting opposite me is present in. What does it mean in terms of how I need to act, how I need to speak, if I want my message to be heard? And ladies and gentlemen, if nothing else works, then breathe, calmly and soothing. Science has documented that only a couple of minutes of soothing breathing will calm down the red system, activate the green system, switch the new brain on, and restore balance. And the good thing is, you can do it wherever and whenever. Or smile to yourself and those around you. Nothing calms the old brain and the red system as a big smile. A smile is not only the shortest distance between two people, it's also the shortest distance to compassion and happiness. Thank, Thank you, you for your attention. Beautiful. And I have promised uh, uh, to, stay Quir there. to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you.
told about tools, and I was very happy about that because uh, it, it's quite hard to be operational here when you talk about compassion. Yeah. We have those three systems, and we know that the red system, fear, threats, is overruling the, over, the, uh, the other ones. And you also said, BBK, that compassion is tough. It's not easy. So, and, and the people who need compassion the most are the ones who do not find that this is easy. Yeah. So, um, where would you recommend us to start if we want to get more compassionate tomorrow? Compassion is all about using knowledge about our brain and our colleagues' brains in everyday life. So, would, if we take a few minutes to consider what system am I in right now, and how does that affect my behavior, and how will that affect other people's behavior, then I have taken a very important step forward. And if I consider this colleague who is angry, who don't get his things done, could there be suffering behind that? Could there be anything else than he's just an idiot? Yeah. You re recommend reflection. Yeah. But we, we have a lot of reflections. We know that uh, we, should, uh, we should do more exercise. Yes, we know that. Everybody knows that. Isn't that true? How many do it? All of us? All the time? Sometimes, yes. We should quit smoking. Well, all smokers know that smoking is dangerous. Mm. Do they continue smoking? Yes, they do. Some of them do. And uh, we know we should eat healthily, <coughs> stuff like that. We know a lot of things, but we don't necessarily do it. So what should be the first step in order to change behavior? We have to find a way to give our brains better working conditions. And the first step to that is actually attention training, mm. mindfulness. Because no matter what, if suffering around us is not noticed, if we are not attentive, if we are not mindful when we're in touch with other people, we can never meet their suffering with compassion because suffering that is not noticed will never be met with compassion. So the first step is actually mindfulness. Yeah, one of the first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Knowledge about the brain and mindfulness. Knowledge about the brain. Giving our brain better working conditions. We are living, as we try to explain, in a modern society where primitive parts of our brain are continuously overstimulated. And can we give our brains better working conditions? Then we can be more compassionate towards ourselves and towards others. I think that your presentation was very powerful. And some of you might uh, want to implement this uh, in your company. What would be the best starting point? We need to learn leaders to be leaders. Hmm. And I think that's the most important place to start. Because today we train leaders to be managers. So they don't learn how to lead themselves. And if you can't lead yourself, you can't lead people. So you have to know your own mind in order to know other people's minds. So I think Leadership training, leadership development is a major uh, play, uh, issue to take seriously. One of, the, one of the good things about the day to day is that the speakers will stay here in the breaks. So you have the opportunity to speak to the speakers. And you have the opportunity to speak to Vivke and Henrik. Let's give them an ovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.